All attempts in our world to change the rules so that people of God face a choice. Compromise or face the consequences. What's your passion? What is something that you really feel strongly about that you need to do something about? The prediction in the Old Testament of the coming of Jesus was with remarkable accuracy. The same with the second coming of Jesus. And this same God allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to save you. Good morning, everybody. Hello to those who aren't sure where I am. I'm hiding over here behind the singers. Nice to see you all this morning. I thought I might encourage us this morning with, with a call to worship from a range of scriptures that emphasize Jesus as our King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen, Psalm 118 verse 1 says, I give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. You know, today we gather not just with each other, but in the presence of Almighty God. The Bible describes him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen to Psalm 95 verse 3. The Lord is a great God and a king above all gods. As we come into this building made with human hands, some of you even helped, let this space resonate with a great truth that our God reigns. Amen? Our God reigns supreme over all creation. You know, He commands stars, yet He knows each one of you and me by name. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. So in a few minutes' time, we're going to have word and song, and you guys are the contributors. You are not the audience. The Bible tells us that we are living stones built up together one upon one upon one, layer upon layer. And so as we worship this morning in word and song, let the majesty of God's holiness fill this place. May our worship be a sweet smell, rising like incense before the throne of God, the Most High. Do you realize when you contribute in song this morning, in word this morning, in prayer this morning, that you are adding to the, the sweet smell of praise unto God. What an interesting way of saying it. Exodus 15 verse 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? As we sing and gather this morning, we declare that our God is unmatched in glory, unrivaled in power. Let every heart bow in reverence. For we sit at the moment and stand in a minute in the presence of the one who spoke galaxies into existence. Psalm 22 verse 28 says, For the kingdom is the Lord's who rules the nations. And this is the great and mighty God who rules the nations. This is what he has declared to you and I today. Listen from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Did you catch that? He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You're being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. And you know what Peter says is our response to that idea, this blessed hope, this inheritance, this imperishable, unfading, undefiled presence in God's presence. 
he says we should rejoice. We should rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. So I thought I'd give you a few more words to call you to worship this morning, pointing you to the majesty of the God who throws galaxies into space, but who's also drawn us in through mercy and grace, giving us a hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Would we stand for prayer? This is part of our worship as we pray now. We're praying to Jesus who has on his robe and on his right thigh a name written. You know what that name is? King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's bow for prayer. Our oh Lord, our King, our Lord, our Saviour, we thank you for the glorious hope that we have kept in heaven for us. We pray, Father, that as we gather for worship this morning, that we might be the contributors, that we together might lift our voices as a sweet aroma to you, hymn of praise and to our God, that many would see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the King of glory.
that were the skies of parchment made Where every stalk on earth it will And every man a scribe by trade To write the law of God for his love today let's pray lord thank you for those words that were spoken thank you for your scriptures lord and father help us to unpack this really difficult issue of marriage and divorce and remarriage lord i pray that you would give me words to speak and lord Uh, Would you open up our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say, Lord, and help us to put these words into practice. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing in our series in the Gospel of Mark. We're up to this passage where Jesus talks about divorce. And um, and, uh, we're using Matthew 19, 1 to 12 as well, because this is the same occasion and, uh, and while Mark is very succinct and to the point, Matthew gives us a little bit more information that, that helps us to understand this passage a little bit more. Now, I was watching SBS the other day and uh, uh, there was an ad came on and, uh, and it was, uh, uh, I think it's the, the, the TV show Insight where they look at current issues and things like that. And it seemed to me they were looking at the issue of marriage and divorce. And um, there was this woman who was speaking, one of the crowd, people in the crowd, and, and she said, I've been divorced 11 times. And she'd been engaged, I think it was 25 times or 28 times. And I thought, my goodness... How could you get into a place where you've married 11 times? And she was listing all the, the, the previous husbands. She had all the things that went wrong. And uh, one thing just flowed into another. And I thought, wow, this is our community. This is our world's view on what marriage is. You know, you can get married, you can divorce whenever you want. But what about the other side? You know, I've seen in my 25 years of pastoring uh, uh, women and men who have come to me who who have lived with really incredible, difficult circumstances that never change year after year. They're still holding on to that truth of the Scriptures to remain married, even though life is a living hell for them. Does God want people to go through this day in, day out with no break, with no way forward? What does the Bible speak on those circumstances? And as we speak on this, I'm aware that there are people in our congregation who have been divorced There are people in our congregation who have remarried and having spoken to so many of them, uh, I just want to reflect what they've always told me. Going through a divorce is the worst. It is terribly, terribly 
traumatic. It's one of the toughest things that people have had to go through. And many people, when they get married, when they walk down the aisle, there is not even that sense, there's not even that thought, this is going to come crashing down in years to come. Sometimes bad things happen, hey? And if you're one of those people today, I just want to pray, I just pray that you would be encouraged And I pray that God would really speak peace into your life today. That you don't have to remain an unforgiven person for the rest of your days in that state of unforgiveness, but that you can truly be forgiven by God if you were wrong in the situation. So let's have a look at this. And and the only way to talk about what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 that we're looking at is is we really need to go right back to the very beginning and look at God's original intent for marriage. So let's just do that briefly. So Genesis tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. He made the firmaments, the stars in the skies. He created the galaxies, the thousands and thousands of galaxies. He he created the sun and there are stars out there that just a thousand times bigger than our sun. There are galaxies that haven't been discovered. God created them all. God created planet Earth. He created. created the plants and the trees and the creatures, the animals that crawl along the ground, the fish in the sea, the birds in the air. And every time, every stage of creation, he said it's good. But his crowning achievement was the creation of man and woman. Made in the image of God. Made in his very image. He formed them, created them, breathed life in them. And and after they were created, the comment was it wasn't just good, it was very good. And in the garden they were put and they they could walk with God, enjoy fellowship with him. And God instituted this thing called marriage. These words come from Genesis 2, 24 and 25. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So God created man and then he created woman. It's not good for man to be alone. And so he instituted this thing called marriage where the, far, the, the, the son and the daughter would leave their parents, their family of origin, and come together and cleave, become one flesh, a sexual union, a friendship that goes beyond all other human relationships. And the intent was, and by the way, this is between a man and a woman. Doesn't say Adam and Steve. I hate using the name Stephen. Or, I don't care, I don't know, what other names? It's between a man and a woman, and the two become one flesh. And this partnership, this, this one flesh, would last a lifetime. It's a place where children could be born in insecurity and in love and support and nurture. It's a place where there can be peace. And and let's take it a step back if you think of the Trinity. Um, Richard was talking about the Trinity in the communion service. There's Father, there's Son, and there's Holy Spirit. Always existed together in communion, in this perfect love communion, this perfect unity, this friendship for all eternity. And the Christian marriage should reflect something of that. 
You know, if you see a Lamborghini, full-size one with its motor and, and, and all its glitter and glamour and you think it's a wonderful thing, you'd love to get in that and drive. But all you can afford is the little model in the shops. You know, it's shiny, it's lovely, but it's nowhere near that. But it's lovely anyway. That kind of reminds me of, of God... The Holy Trinity and how it's perfect in its love and, and a marriage relationship. Well, it's not quite there, but it reflects the love of Christ. And when Christian couples come together and they become one flesh, flesh they're taking God with them into that marriage. They're taking the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father and of the Son into that marriage. And it should its intent is to reflect the love of the Trinity, reflect the love of God, the love of Christ in that marriage. And Paul uses this whole illustration of marriage in Ephesians where, where he's, he's talking about husbands and wives and how they should relate to each other, but he's talking about the church being in exactly the same situation. We as a church should reflect the love of God. Never, ever to be separated, this marriage relationship. That's God's Original intents. But we know what happened, hey? This great harmony was spoilt in the garden. Um, sin came, Adam and Eve sinned, and, and with that sin came this, this disharmony where man was separated from God. Through sin, we as humans see God not as a loving father, but as a judge. And we look upon creation and creation looks upon us with enmity and there's thorns and there's thistles as we try to eke a living out of this place. And there's also disharmony with husband and wife, with, with human relations. And marriage is now a struggle. Have a listen to these words to the woman. He said, I'll greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded. See, the wife isn't always right. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. So this great harmony was spoiled and so marriage now became wonderful and good and the intent was still there, but it was always going to be thorns and thistles in the midst. It was going to require hard work from both parties. It could still be meaningful. It could still be wonderful. It could still reflect the love of Christ, but that required Jesus in the marriage. That required uh, uh, hard work from husband and wife to make it work. Anyone who's been married for a long period of time recognises this. At every stage of life, you're dealing with something. Because of sin, that image of the, what God's intent of marriage was is, has been marred. But the intent is still there. The desire is still there. And because of sin, unfortunately, marriages do break down. Marriages do fall apart. So what happened in the Bible to allow for these things? God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. He hates sin. He hates divorce, but he knows what people are like. So built into the law of Moses, there were provisions. Have a listen to this. This is from Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, 
because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. And after, and if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, give it to her, gives it to her and sends her from this house. Or if he dies, then the first husband who divorced her is not allowed to remarry her again after she has been defiled. So because the world is not perfect anymore, the marriage intent is still there, the goal of marriage is to stay there for life, things happen and God in his grace, in his mercy, by allowing this to be written into the law was to, to, uh, to, to stop the, the fallout, stop the damage, to, to have a safety net by when things happened, there was a place to have divorce, an appropriate place for divorce. And if we look at this, the wording in here, the certificate of divorce was given uh, because the husband has found something indecent about the woman. Now, that usually refers to adultery. So here we have uh, the Mosaic law saying that if all else fails, there is a divorce and a certificate is given uh, to that person who is to be sent on that way. Now, if you think about it, if a husband divorces a wife back in those days, it generally meant poverty for that woman. It meant hardships. If a woman is put out and, 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 and left to herself, it meant hardship. And so God in his grace is trying to look after the person who's been put out. And a certificate of divorce is written and always in that certificate of divorce it says, you are free to marry any Jew you wish. That was the divorce certificate on the grounds of adultery here. So God in his grace saw that marriage was going to be a problem, saw that things like adultery would take place, and so a divorce was, uh, you know, God hates divorce, but he gives it. So that there wouldn't be as much damage to the spouse who's been put out. Allows her to remarry so that she's under the protection of another husband. Now... We ask the question, is adultery the only grounds for divorce in the Old Testament? Is it the only grounds? Are there others? Well, a Jew would tell you there are others. Uh, it's, it's a fairly discreet little passage, but it's a very important little passage. It's from Exodus 21, 10 to 11, around the time of Moses again. And it says this, if he marries another woman... He must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. If he does not provide her with these three things, she is free to go without any payment of money. So what's being said here in the context of this is this guy has a slave that he marries. And then down the track, he takes on another wife. Okay, it's polygamy. God frowned upon that as well but he allowed it in Middle Eastern circumstances. So, but then, if the husband neglects the slave wife, if he does not provide her with these three things, food, clothing, and marital rights, which means um, sex, sex, um, I can't even think of the word I'm trying to think of. I'm getting embarrassed and I'm blushing now. I'm talking about sex. <laughs> marital relations, marital sexual relations. So those three things, food, clothing, and marital rights. If he is depriving her of that, she's free to go. She's free to go. So this is really interesting because the Jews saw this 
as a reason for divorce. The Jews practiced this right through to the time of Jesus. It was an opportunity once again, if there is neglect, if there is abuse, there is a way out of that situation. And the Jews figured, the Jews figured that if, if a slave girl could have those rights, any woman could have those rights. If there is abuse, if there is neglect. So we've got four grounds for divorce in the Old Testament that Jews lived by. Adultery, the withdrawal of food, clothing, and sexual intercourse in the marriage. They were the grounds of divorce. And it's really interesting over the centuries that Jewish marriage vows were connected to this. In their vows, they would vow to provide the, the, their wives with food, clothing, and marital rights, conjugal status. Four things. If you add adultery to that. And do you know what? When we look at, when we trace the, our English marriage vows, our Christian marriage vows, it can go right back to that passage. You know, the promise to love, the promise to be faithful, the promise to look after her physical needs and, and, and all of these things, they're traced back to this through the Jewish marriage ceremony. So the breaking of these marital vows were grounds for divorce. And even then, I want to stress this, even then God's desire is reconciliation. God's desire is to patch it up, that, that things would be made right. There would be forgiveness and a restoration and, a, and, and rights made wrong, wrongs made right. Even Paul, when he's in Ephesians chapter 5, he's talking about this. He's talking about uh, husbands you need to feed. You need to nurture just as Christ did, does with the church. We can see these threads going all the way back to Exodus 21. The other thing that's worth noting in the Old Testament is that God himself is a divorcee. God initiated divorce with the Israelites. Remember, God brought them out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai. It's there at Mount Sinai. There was a covenant, a marriage-like covenant, where the, the people promised to worship only God, that they wouldn't commit adultery with other gods and Jesus and God made promises to them, I'll look after you, I'll nurture you, I'll clothe you, I'll feed you. I will be your God, you will be my people, I will be your husband, you will be my bride. And he carried her across the threshold of the Jordan River into this promised land where he did, he fed, he clothed them. And yet continuously they prostituted themselves, they committed adultery with other idols of the Canaanites. Remember that passage, that the book of Hosea, where God instructs Hosea to marry a prostitute. And, and, and this prostitute would go out and sell herself to men every day and, and Hosea's heart's breaking and God is saying, you know what, this prophet, he's doing, this is a picture of me with you, Israel. He sent prophets to warn. He sent prophets to, to, to tell them what they're doing so that they could repent and come back and get this marriage-related sorted. But in the end, God said, enough. Enough. Not because he broke covenant, because the Israelites broke covenant. It's not a sin to be a victim and seek a divorce if nothing else can be done, if everything's been tried, if everything has been put into that marriage and that person who's the offender is unrepentant and unchanging because that's the picture of God with Israel. 
So then we come to this passage in Mark 10, where the Pharisees come up to Jesus. It says that they were testing him, but I think it's even more than that. And I'll get to that in a minute. They say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So that's the question that's asked. And and Matthew chapter 19 is a more thoroughly Jewish gospel. And these few words that are added in chapter 19 actually add terrific perspective to this passage. In Matthew 19, it says, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Okay, that, that, that last phrase in Matthew 19 means something. See, there were, there were two schools of thought happening in Jesus' time, and it was a hot topic. There was the Hillel rabbi school that said a divorce can happen on any grounds, on any cause. And they traced it back to Moses' words when he gave them permission to write out a certificate of divorce for adultery. And they said, for any and every reason, the word cause back there in, in Deuteronomy means any cause. And so this Hillel school said, you can divorce for any reason. If your wife spoils your meal, divorce her. If your husband snores, divorce him. If he's lazy, divorce him. Get rid of him. If, he, if she's uh, spotted talking to a man, divorce him. Write a certificate, tell her to get out. That's it. That's what was happening in Jesus' day, and it was growing more and more that same way. Marriages were being trashed a bit like today in the Jewish world. The other school, the Shammai school, said, no, divorce doesn't happen for any cause. Here's the biblical grounds, the four grounds for biblical divorce. No others. And so this debate was raging all over this phrase, for any and every reason or for any and every cause. That's why Matthew 19.3 is very important for us to get this context. There was a real battle going on. People were divorcing for any and every reason because of the Hillel school and because of the Shammai school, people were saying, no, biblical, the four biblical reasons are it. What was Jesus' response? He said, well, what does Moses say? Let me just read it so I'm in context What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote this to you, Jesus replied. And then he starts talking about biblical creation and the institution of marriage back in Genesis. He says, back at the beginning of creation, creation, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become flesh. Therefore, let no one separate. So that was Jesus' answer to these guys. With this in mind, then he goes on. So they're asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus says, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So what Jesus is saying, this Hillel interpretation of any cause divorce is wrong. And if you divorce someone using that cause, any cause thing, and you marry another person, you're guilty of committing adultery. If you've just involved, you know, just used any cause to divorce your wife, using this any cause clause, and then you go and get married, you're committing adultery with the woman you married. So this is not saying adultery is the only reason. 
As we've seen, there are biblical grounds for divorce, abuse being part of that, neglect being part of that. But it's not for any and every cause. Let me reiterate, God hates divorce. He's been there. He wants us all to work it out. Those grounds, any reason, clause, well, that's how our world lives. That's why that woman got divorced 13 times. What does this mean for us today? I've just got a few things I'd like to say. And I want to start from the very beginning. Marriage is God's creation. It should be honoured and upheld. God hates divorce. If there is any way of repairing a marriage going pear-shaped, it should be tried at all costs. Because divorce hurts. Divorce has consequences that last a long time. That's what this second clause says. Divorce is a last op- option. God's pathway, whenever we're going through, is reconciliation, forgiveness, and restoration. The biblical grounds for divorce are adultery, neglect, or abuse. They're, they're broken marriage vows that go all the way back to Exodus 21. Deuteronomy. But that doesn't mean if these things happen, you should divorce. There's always a way forward if both parties are willing. No one should initiate a divorce unless their partner is guilty of repeatedly or unrepentantly breaking their marriage vows. So if a husband comes home drunk every night and he smacks into you or he verbally abuses you every night without fail or he withholds your food, withholds your money, keeps you locked up in a house and he's never going to change no matter how hard you've tried. You've even tried to get professional help but it's not working When all else fails, there is grounds for divorce. God's grace is here as well. If someone has divorced or separated without biblical grounds, they should attempt a reconciliation with their former pastor. Now I know that often it's too late Often there's no chance of getting back together, especially if you have remarried. And, you know, to break up your new marriage, two wrongs don't make a right, do they? What honours God is repentance and receiving his forgiveness and moving on and honouring your new wife and at all times finding a way to settle and, 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 and uh, reconcile that conflict you had with a former partner. That may not always be possible, but you try. A divorced person does not need to remain unmarried forever if the divorcee was based on biblical grounds. As I said, it's always reconciliation. It's always pushing towards a healing of the marriage. But when that unfolds, when that fails after trying everything, remarriage after divorce, and it's, if the divorce is based on biblical grounds, it's permissible. Lastly, God forgives sin. Breaking marriage vows is a terrible sin, but God forgives when we come to him in repentance. Even if you were responsible for the marriage breakdown, even if you were the neglecter, even if you were the abuser, there's still room for God's forgiveness. You don't have to live in this perpetual state of unforgiveness, this place of divorce where you feel you're out of whack with God the rest of your life. No, God forgives 
God's grace is there in the midst of a divorce. God's grace is there when you're carrying that guilt, when you're carrying that shame. It's there. Jesus died on the cross for you to take care of your sin, to, 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 to bring you back to him. And there's no sin in a marriage situation that is unforgivable. The only unforgivable sin is when we don't repent, when we don't recognise our own sin. Just want to pause now. And I want to take time to, to pray for those who have been divorced. To pray for those who are carrying so much pain and guilt, shame, and stigma. I want to remind you that God loves you and he cares for you and he wants to see you move on with life. He's got a purpose for you. Yes, divorce was rotten. It was a mess. But there's still a future. I want to pray for you. And perhaps there's some people in this congregation who are going through a messy time in their marriage. Things just don't seem to be working out. That ideal is just so distorted and messed up and it just seems like there's no way out. I want to pray for you there too, that God would intervene, that you would, first of all, put your, fix your thoughts, your sights on Jesus and trust him and do everything you can to come together, even if you need help. I want to pray for those who are single, those who are lonely, those who are struggling because they don't have a life partner. I want to pray for those who, who just see such an uncertain future because they don't see that life partner on the radar. I'm going to pray that your trust will be completely on God, that you trust him in every circumstance. And if your marriage is going great guns and everything's fine, I just want to just give you this opportunity to say thanks, God, for my marriage partner. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. One of the greatest pictures of God's grace in the Bible is King David. We know the story of King David, don't we? David already had multiple wives, but he spotted Bathsheba one night bathing on another building and he just had to have her, summonsed her, committed adultery with her, gave orders that her husband be killed in battle. Of course, she's pregnant. Of course, the baby dies as a consequent, consequence, but David repents. And God forgives. And it's interesting, the baby, next baby born to Bathsheba is King Solomon, the next in line, that line all the way to Jesus Christ. God still kept his promise to David who was going to be one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. And that's the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ. He could have just wiped David and started his lineage with someone else, but as we see right through this line, there's grace, there's mercy, there's forgiveness. Even to a murderer and an adulterer. Let's just pray. Lord, I want to just bring to you those who are living with the pain of divorce. 
those who were just victims because of a, a person's actions, unrepentant actions, or whether they can take blame and responsibility. Just pray, Lord, that they would know your grace and mercy. I pray, Lord, that you would shower them with your love and your blessing. I pray, Lord, that they're not going to live in this state of feeling unforgiven, but they would know by the blood of Jesus forgiveness. I want to pray for those who are struggling in their marriage right now. They seem to be doing everything they can to do something, Lord, but it just seems to be going pear-shaped. I pray that you would intervene, that they would look to you and both come to you to seek a way forward, even when a way forward cannot be seen. But I pray for those who are single and yearn to be married. I pray for those who are doing life alone. Just pray, Lord, you would be their all-sufficiency right now. Lord, I thank you for the blessing of marriage. There's some here, Lord, who want to say thank you for the spouse that you have given me. Thank you for your grace and mercy there as well. There's a line in this song that says, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. I speak that name over all of us this morning as we conclude our service. We're speaking Jesus into our relationships. Jesus into our marriages. Jesus into our families. Jesus, the answer the one who redeems, forgives, and brings us new life. Let's stand and sing together as we close our service.
shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. for my family. I speak the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for our family. I speak the holy name.
is for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus. Say it again, Jesus. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Lord, we pray that your grace, your mercy, and your peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now. And every single moment between now and when we meet you face to face, we go in your peace. Go in peace. Amen.